Welcome everybody. Um, today I'll be talking to, uh, to you about how AI technology shapes our lives. And I will start at the very beginning, 1984, uh, when uh, one of my favorite novels came out. Um, it's called Necromancer, uh, Neuromancer, uh -huh. by William Gibson. It was published in 1984. I read it curiously. It's one of my uh, favorite novels. And in this novel, uh, William Gibson develops this dystopian society that's run by corporations, mega corporations. Uh, there's a virtual reality called The Matrix, um, in which uh, people can actually enter and live out their lives. And also, very importantly, uh, it talks about sentient machines, AIs, that actually try to control humans and try to manipulate humans and try to deal with human nature. And I, was, I read this and I was really fascinated uh, by this because he develops this, this beautiful story, this very deep story about how the AIs and the humans sort of fight with, with each other almost. And uh, at the time, this was 1984, this seemed like true science fiction. This seemed ages away. Uh, sentient machines, thinking machines, machines that talk to humans, interact with humans, live sort of with humans in a way. And uh, another very dystopian uh, thing that probably all of you know is uh, Terminator 1 that also came out in 1984, which talks about the fallout of a sentient machine, Skynet, basically waging war on humans. So at that time, the idea of having sentient machines in 1984, 40 years ago, seemed really very, very, very far away. Uh, but it's now 2024 and people are starting to talk about this and depending on who you talk to, people say, well, in a year, in five years, in ten years, we will have thinking machines. We will have such machines that are able to interact with us, talk to us, etc. and act in human society. Just to give an idea, so um, AI in 1984 was relegated to some very, very niche uh, uh, applications with basically just rule-based systems, very, very simplistic. It was the start of the personal computing age. I bought my very first computer with 128 kilobytes of RAM. Fantastic. It made lots of stuff. But sentient thinking machines at the time was really, truly science fiction. And so people had been working in AI for a long time already by then. And uh, the idea for building a sentient machine, an intelligent machine, actually is literally taken from human inspiration. Let's say, right, we know humans, well, some humans are intelligent. So humans have brains, brains work on neurons, so why don't we do that? Why don't, why don't we invent neural networks, simulate them, and build intelligent machines? This idea is not new. It had been around for a long time, 1940s, 1950s, people started getting very, very excited uh, about this new technology, trying to promise a lot of things, but they fell short. Actually, this was the first AI winter and research on neural networks died in a little bit in its tracks. This was 1960s. Now, actually, that research came up again in the 1980s because people were saying, hey, let's try this this time. You know, neurons, we should be able to simulate that. We should be able to build artificial brains based on neural networks. Why don't we try and do this? And people tried this again, and it fell short again. People made promises. They couldn't keep it. People were very, very disappointed in what came out. And uh, this is now the situation when uh, I myself, uh, as a young postdoc in 2006, attended a workshop uh, here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, that's the workshop picture here. Um, there's a guy, whoops, sorry. Uh, there is a guy here, still with hair, a little bit. That's me. I was a young postdoc and I was very excited to go to this workshop. It was a workshop on computer vision, making machines see and understand images. And all of these people here, uh, they were the luminaries in the field about computer vision. I was really excited uh, to hear all those talks. And uh, there was one particular person shown here who gave a very, very passionate talk about his work. And he was talking about neural networks. In fact, he was saying they work great, they're fantastic, let's use them. I've been working on this for quite some time. They really do work. And everybody around him said, well, thank you, very nice presentation, but you know, we tried it a few times. The field tried it. We, we said, it doesn't work, right? It will fail. It doesn't scale. It really, you know, it's a nice presentation, but thank you, but no thank you. And I still remember this presentation because it made a huge impact on me because he was passionately uh, about this, uh, defending about this topic. And if you don't know this person, um, he's Jan Lecker who is head of AI research at Meta right now and the winner of the ACM uh, 
2018 Turing Award, which is the Nobel Prize for Computer Science in a way. And he won it for his contributions for neural networks. And now you can say, well, take that academics, it actually does work. And it worked because of a number of things happening. And one of the pivotal points here, which I want to highlight is 2012, when one publication appeared, and I still remember reading it, this was uh, published by Geoffrey Hinton and his team. And it was on computer vision, making machines see. So recognize there's a cat, there's a dog. And at the time, this was a hard problem. And now came this neural network, uh, which they termed deep neural network at some point. And it was able to do it much, much better than the competition. It blew everything out of the water. And I was really, I still remember, it's not too long ago, I was reading this paper and I was like, fantastic, that's amazing. It was so much better. And the reason why it was so much better is because they were finally able to feed these neural networks with lots of data, really lots of data. And they had fast enough machines, GPUs, that were able to process lots and lots of data. So that made it suddenly work. So we suddenly had a system that, yes, showed promise to become a little bit intelligent. And uh, this meant two fields in AI research that people had been trying to work on uh, actually got a huge boost. One was computer vision, making machines see, recognizing faces, doing surveillance, uh, doing medical image diagnosis, etc. The other one was uh, natural language processing, trying to understand text, trying to understand text like the human can understand text. And so these two big applications suddenly say, saw a new sort of push because people said, hey, let's try this with neural networks. We saw they work here. Let's try this again. And uh, the problem with that was a little bit. I told you that the reason why it worked is because they were made large. These neural networks were really getting a lot of hungry uh, input here. And that meant that unfortunately there was started a push that uh, research on AI moved from academia to large companies that actually were able to afford the computational resources in order to deal with this stuff. And this brings us to today basically where we have actually companies that are developing solutions that you probably all have heard of and interacted with in many cases for computer vision, for example. Uh, so we have companies that work on image recognition, face recognition, medical image diagnosis. We have companies work using AI and neural networks to develop new drugs. Uh, we have, of course, in the other, on the other hand, we have generative AI. You probably all have had experiences with uh, large language models like ChatGPT, but other companies also make these. And they're able to generate text. We are able to converse with them a little bit. Uh, they're able to write text to us. Generative AI can create pictures for us, videos for us as well. Uh, so this is a large, large change that's happening and companies are uh, pushing this because they are able to actually train these networks and make them work and let them work for these types of applications that are increasingly being shown here. Uh, now, the current AI market worldwide is estimated to be about $200 billion. That sounds like a lot, but it's a joke compared to what people expect in the next 10 years to happen, which is a tenfold exponential increase in that. So we will have AI technology going through pretty much all of our economy, all of our lives, uh, changing the way the job market works. I'm seeing this already. Companies are telling me, wait, mm, we don't want to hire entry-level programmers, for example, because AI can code. AI can write code for us. I just tell the AI to write this code. It will do it for us. So entry-level jobs will be increasingly automated simply because AI is good enough to do this. So we will see a lot of things happening on the job market where we need to reskill people and upskill people going away from standard entry-level jobs to actually jobs that use AI to go to the next level, so to speak. So that's one very, very big push that's going to happen. Now, what's happening right now in AI research uh, is AI becoming what is called agentic. Typically, right now, AI is you give it a task, it, it responds, and then that's about it. But agentic AI means you will have little AI programs that can go out and do tasks for you on their own. Simple example is you tell the AI, I want to take a nice vacation go to Seoul, uh, I have a certain budget around this time of year and you know I would like that to fly with that airline, etc. And the AI agent will go out and book this for you. 
it will simply just go ahead and book this uh, because it has access to, to your credit card, for example, and then come back with your itinerary. It's a very simple example of an AI agent, and we will see, and we are seeing this already, agents being developed by several companies that can do this. And it can, of course, once you give it access to human society on several interfaces, then AI will do increasingly more of these types of things. And we are starting to see increased involvement of AI agents in daily life. Now, this means there is a big push, of course, in terms of securing this next level competition. Uh, so we are seeing uh, increased worldwide competition, not only among companies like, let's say, OpenAI, Naver, Kakao, Baidu, whoever you name it, but also, of course, countries wanting to have this AI technology in their, uh, in their reach. And this is necessary and this is happening because, like I told you, AI research requires enormous funding, enormous resources. So training one of these models like ChatGPT can cost hundreds of millions of dollars. This is simply not possible for small companies and it's definitely not possible for academics like myself. So we are seeing this again that research on AI has moved away from academia outside to companies who can afford to deal with these types of resources. So What's happening right now is we're seeing more smart uh, AI systems coming out. And you may think about this famous concept of the so-called singularity that was uh, made popular by Ray Kurzweil. He initially predicted it to be somewhere in 2070 or something. He now has actually decreased it by 2030. And depending on who you ask, we will actually achieve artificial general intelligence in the next year, in the next few years, in the next decade. But that means it's right at our doorstep. It happens. It's just right around the corner. Things are moving incredibly fast. And once you have systems like this that are intelligent enough, things will accelerate. And this acceleration can be very good. It can also pose dangers. And in fact, people have been asking around and they've conducted polls uh, to AI researchers. Well, how dangerous could it be? And about more than half of AI researchers say that there is at least a 10% chance of a really catastrophic failure. And that is a non-trivial number. So people really think there is risk ahead of us. So we need to work on mitigating that risk. We need to work on two things. Uh, and that's my call for action here today. We need to work on better regulation. We need to work uh, to talk to the policymakers about this. Uh, try to expedite processes that regulate the development of AI towards like safe paths and nice paths for humanities. We already have several uh, efforts in this place, but it's, it's slow, but it's moving along. But we need to really redouble these efforts. So that's number one. And uh, number two, oops, number two is education. Uh, number two means we need to be aware of uh, what's actually happening, like from across all levels of society. We need to better educate our students, like even in kindergarten, all the way up to people uh, standard out of the job, uh, in their job. We need to educate everybody on what AI can and can't do and what the limits of AI are and what the potential of AI is and what we can do to actually safely steer this development towards a nice place. So with that, I will and on two things that I want everybody to perhaps try and think about and try and push. So first of all, stay on top of things. AI is moving very fast. AI technology is already shaping our lives and will shape it much more in the future. So stay on top of this, uh, get informed, get educated, uh, visit websites and talk to people around you. And uh, the second part is if you have access to uh, elected officials, make them aware that AI regulation is something they would need to prioritize because we need these types of regulations to go towards a safe development like this so that we don't end up in a neuromancer or terminator dystopia but rather some nice more like utopian future which i would like to live in and perhaps you too thank you very much